Good afternoon, everyone. So I want to welcome all of y'all in. We'll be starting in about five minutes. Some people are still joining us. Welcome to everyone that's joining us right now. Good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna start in about four minutes, but more people are joining, so letting everyone in. Welcome everyone. We're gonna give more individuals a few more minutes just to hop on. It's glad to see everyone virtually. I know we've been doing the webinar feature, so this is the meeting feature. It's nice to see some faces. Welcome to the everyone joining us right now. We're gonna give a few more minutes for everyone to hop in. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to get started just to be respectful of everyone's time, and then we're going to let anyone else in as soon as they join us. So good afternoon. We're excited to see so many faces today. Uh, welcome to our first Sun and Star program this spring. As always, we're always delighted to have you all here. A little bit about how today is going to go. Um, as I said, our pledge is to have you out here and wrap up by 7.30. I will introduce our moderator, 
and then who will introduce our speaker. After our speaker presents, we will have a short moderated discussion followed by Q&A from the audience. If you do have questions throughout the program, please do enter them in the chat. You can either enter them in the chat or send them to Hiroki who will be moderating today. Um, please also make sure to have yourself muted throughout the our program. Um, this is your first time attending our events. Welcome. Um, we hope you do visit our website and sign up to see more of our events this spring. Um, I don't know if many of y'all know me, but I'm Bora and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and the Director of Studies at the Tower Center. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Hiroki Takeuchi. He is the director of the Sun and Star program on Japan and East Asia. He's a professor at SMU and a senior fellow at the Tower Center. Hiroki, I will now turn it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Bora. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Sun and Star uh, webinar series on Japan and East Asia. Uh, we are in Texas, so uh, we are sound star program and the star has to be uh, a singular because we are in Texas. Um, so today uh, we are going to um, have a, a, a Mr. John Hillman um, the, uh, at the CSIS, Center for Strategic uh, International Studies. Um, so uh, the, before uh, starting, uh, before introducing, um, today's speaker. Uh, this is the first uh, Sunstar webinar series. So uh, I, I thank on behalf of the Tower Center, I thank uh, Bora and the whole team of the SMU Tower Center staff led by uh, Luisa de Rosal. Uh, I also thank uh, Japan Airlines for their support for SMU Tower Center and uh, SMU in Japan program uh, in Kansei Gakuin University. So um, today, the first um, Sound Star webinar, uh, we are going to have uh, John Hillman, uh, who is at CSIS, and he is directing uh, the program of the Belt and Road Initiative. And he's going to talk about uh, his book uh, about BRI, uh, that is this one. So, uh, so the Emperor's New Road, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, and the China and the Project of the Century. So BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, is an interesting um, project. And it's a national project of uh, People's Republic of China. Many people talk about it, but uh, very few people know about what it is. So that's why we have John today uh, and then ask him to uh, talk about uh, BRI. So a few years ago, uh, when I was in the um, seminar uh, of the SMU uh, Mission Foods Texas Mexico Center, uh, so uh, Texas lawmaker uh, spoke about uh, Texas Mexico relations and nothing related to China. And then oh, I introduced myself and I'm actually, I'm a China specialist. And uh, he immediately asked me, do you know a one belt one road? Um, well, so I was a bit surprised. Uh, well, I answered that I know somehow uh, One Belt, One Road. Uh, but at the same time, this is actually uh, One Belt, One Road. Now it's called the B uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, because uh, for Ch Chinese government's perspective, Belt and Road uh, do not have to be uh, singular. So that's why it's now called uh, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so uh, this is actually what uh, shows uh, why like, uh, what um, understanding BRI is so important. So uh, those who do not, um, who, those who do not know about China so well, uh, st is still interested, are still interested in uh, BRI. And then, so uh, that is very influential and it's a, a Chinese national project. So uh, we would like to hear uh, from John about what it is and then what is the implication uh, on uh, the world politics. So please welcome uh, to, uh, for, uh, please, well, uh, please join me for welcoming uh, John Hillman. Thanks very much, Hiroki. And uh, thanks, Bora, as well, for your help. Uh, and thanks to the Tower Center for the opportunity. Also um, want to thank my friend, Kelly McGowan, who I think um, was the one who, who initially um, put us in touch. Uh, and so I see, good to see him uh, on the, on the uh, call today as well. Um, let me share my screen here. I, I've got a few slides I wanna run through because 
honestly, it's tough to talk about Belt and Road without talk without using a few maps um, and and figures. Um, it's just it's too big to um, sort of begin to get your arms around without um, a little bit of visual help. Um, so hopefully, Hiroki, is that coming through? Yes. You're able to see that? Okay. Yes, great. I can see it. Yes. Okay. So um, yeah, I, I'd like to do I'd like to do three things today. Um, the first is to just talk a bit about what this initiative um, is, uh, you know, what it was when, when it was announced and how it's changed. Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, the gap between how it's described and the reality on the ground. That's a real theme in this book um, that I've written. And then I want to look ahead a little bit because this is something, there's a set of activities that continues to evolve um, to, feet, to, to fit um, the circumstances which have, which have changed quite dramatically since it was announced. Um, but just to, just to begin to orient us here, you're looking at a map um, you know, mainly centered on the Eurasian supercontinent. Um, and this is a depiction of the Belt and Road um, that was in a Chinese state media outlet in 2014 or 2015. It's just something we've recreated at CSIS. So it's not really our version of this. It is based on, you know, a, a state media um, portrayal of it. And you see in this, this initial conception of the Belt and Road, which was announced in 2013, you see really two main dimensions, uh, an overland belt, and then somewhat confusingly a maritime road. Um, those were announced by Xi Jinping in two separate speeches in late 2013. Uh, but since then, this initiative has really just expanded and expanded. Um, and so it now includes not only the overland um, belt, the maritime road, um, but it also includes an Arctic dimension that's not captured in this map. It also includes many more activities in Africa, activities in Latin America. Um, and, and I'll show you a, a map in a, a minute or two of the countries participating in this. We now have 140 countries that in one way or another, whether signing an MOU or a cooperation agreement, have signed up to participate in China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the part of this that I'm going to focus on primarily today um, is the infrastructure dimension of Belt and Road. That's not the only dimension of Belt and Road. You know, in its initial conception, it also includes trade agreements, it includes people-to-people -people ties, and it includes policy coordination across a whole host of issues. And I think what all of those things have in common is um, they're all forms of connectivity. And so, you know, if you really want to sort of summarize what this is about, I think it's about China strengthening its co different connections with other countries, moving itself more toward the center of those activities uh, in, in some places more successfully than other places. Uh, let me also note too, that there has nev there's never been an official criteria for what qualifies as a Belt and Road project. So this is one of the, the reasons why this is a difficult thing to study analytically. It, I think continues to fuel debate about really what this is about. Um, and there continues to be debate about really what it is even you know, more than seven years after it's been announced. Let me provide just a little bit of context for um, why I wrote this book and some of my own experience going to visit projects. Um, so the, the book really combines some of my research at CSIS with um, some uh, field work that I've done going to visit projects in different places. Um, the photo that we're looking at here is a photo of the first Belt and Road Forum in 2017 um, held in Beijing. And you see Xi Jinping giving a toast um, I was able to actually attend the forum um, in 2017, and I was, you know, blown away by um, all of the pomp and circumstance around it. I mean, literally, they were rolling out the red carpet. Um, you had over two dozen heads of state who attended. There were representatives from uh, over 110 countries and international organizations. It was very well organized. Lots of, um, you know, agreements signed. Um, and so I, I, I was there and, and really it felt to me almost like a preview of uh, a world in which the United States was playing only um, an observer role. You know, the, the US was there participating, but uh, in a sort of reduced capacity, they sent a senior official, you know, who was really not that senior at the time compared to who other countries were sending and a very small delegation. 
Um, and so it felt like in a way, you know, this is the world had showed up uh, for China's initiative and the US was there as sort of a spectator. Um, I left this forum and the first, the first place that I went to um, was Kyrgyzstan, which is, you know, shares a border with China. And um, it was sort of even before I left the country, left China, that I started to question some of my initial perceptions about what this thing actually was. Um, and so we were looking at here a photo of um, the uh, border between China and Kazakhstan. Um, when I was passing through it in 2017, this particular part of the border, there were seven checkpoints. Um, and so this is somewhere but you know between probably checkpoint four and five. Um, and the reason why there's a line of trucks and the, re the re reason why I have this photo is because the border guards went on lunch break. Um, and it wasn't just a 30 minute lunch break. This was several hours lunch break. And so you see this, this line of cars pile up. Um, now, why does this matter? I think, you know, for me, it was the first, you know, real sign, uh, real warning that um, the Belton Road, as it's described in Grand Halls, as it was described in the forum that I had just attended in Beijing, is not necessarily the same as the Belton Road actually is on the ground. And so China, as it is forging these new connections, has to contend um, with uh, many challenges, including you know, borders and border guards taking lunch breaks. And so I'll, what a lot of my work has tried to do is to try to get a better sense for how, how these projects are actually unfolding, or in some cases not unfolding on the ground. I, I mentioned this earlier, this is just sort of a brief overview. I wanna talk a bit about some of the initial hype around the Belt and Road when it was announced. Um, the, the actual reality on the ground. And then I want to look ahead briefly because this is something that continues to change. Just to, to give you a sense for the financial scale of the Belt and Road, um, the number that we often hear, most often hear associated with it is $1 trillion in promised investment for infrastructure. I think the key word there is promised. Um, the best data that I've seen so far suggests that maybe about half of this um, has been um, actually, um, uh, uh, not, not even really delivered, but contracts that are worth about half of this have been signed. Um, and then even a smaller percentage of that are actual projects that have been delivered. And I can uh, say a little bit more about that later. Uh, but this, that, that's a really significant amount of um, spending. And you know, if you put it in historical terms, it's about seven times as large as the Marshall Plan would be if the Marshall Plan were adjusted for inflation today. Um, there are also some pretty important distinctions, though, between the Marshall Plan and what that was and what the Belt and Road is. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the Belt and Road has no criteria for what qualifies as a project. It's very um, geographically open-ended. It continues to expand. I'll show you a map in just a moment of all the countries participating in it. It's functionally open-ended uh, and it's temporally open-ended. There is no, you know, specific end date for the Belt and Road. And even projects that were started before the Belt and Road was officially announced in 2013 are often counted toward it. Um, and now I think the most important distinction though between the Marshall Plan and China's Belt and Road Initiative um, is that the Marshall Plan was very geographically focused on a specific set of countries. Belt and Road continues to expand and Belt and Road has a very heavy emphasis on emerging uh, markets, you know, developing and emerging economies. Uh, the Marshall Plan was really about rebuilding economies that had already been developed um, that's much easier to do. Uh, it's much more difficult to uh, develop economies that have not been developed before. Um, and that's why I think you see in this map, um, 140 countries participating um, with a really heavy emphasis on developing emerging markets. Um, the countries that are in dark blue are those that have signed um, MOUs for the Belt and Road, um, which are sometimes viewed as the sort of uh, most serious form of uh, official participation. The light blue are countries that have signed cooperation agreements. Um, and I, I, think, I think there's been a really wide range of experiences though for countries that have actually signed up to this. Um, you have some countries like South Korea who have seen little to no actual benefit. Um, some countries like Pakistan that have seen pretty significant levels of project activity um, and then many in between. Um, and I think it's important not to um, think about these MOUs um, not to give them more weight than they deserve. Um, many of them have not been made public. And so I'm a little bit hesitant to generalize about what's in all of them. But from the ones we've seen, 
these are very aspirational documents. Um, it's not some it's not something that should be compared to a trade agreement, um, you know, which is much more substantive and forcible. Um, these are documents that talk about really broad areas of cooperation. Some of them literally say on the bottom of them, um, this is not a legally binding document. Um, and, and so I, I just think it's important to sort of view these as more political signals than uh, operational agreements. This, to, this, this uh, comparison to me captures, I think, one of the, um, one of the uh, sort of most common complaints that I hear uh, from countries that have signed up to this and have actually done projects. Um, the Belt and Road is advertised as being win-win. Um, you know, Chinese officials say that often, meaning that it benefits them, it benefits the countries that are participating um, in the Belt and Road. And this is a comparison we did looking at projects that China has funded um, and who's getting those contracts uh, and comparing that to projects that are funded by multilateral development banks. So in this case, uh, World Bank and Asian Development Bank. And you can see, you know, really clearly in the China funded projects, uh, Chinese contractors are getting about 90% um, of that work. This doesn't capture subcontracting, which is an important uh, way in which um, you know, these activities could uh, be, could involve more local companies. Um, but it does show you that, you know, the lion's share of this work is going to uh, China's own companies. Uh, and that makes sense because China has seven of the world's 10 largest construction companies. Many of them have built so much at home that they've essentially run out of things to build. And so the Belt and Road Initiative for them has been a good way to, to continue to go uh, and do projects. You also see though, Chinese companies very competitive in the multilateral development bank um, process, which often involves um, bidding on projects. Um, and that's because of that scale that they have developed domestically, the state support that they enjoy, um, but they're quite competitive in that process as well. I, I'm gonna show you briefly uh, three areas um, or maybe just two actually. Um, that are, I think are it's indicative of the reality here on the ground. Um, one of them is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. This is important because Chinese officials refer to this as a flagship project of the Belt and Road. Um, and there's been relatively high levels of project activity, although even uh, in, in Pakistan, um, only a fraction of what has been promised has been delivered. So the official number for projects that have been complete has gone up a little bit uh, since we did this assessment. So it's probably closer to 25 billion now, um, but that's still only, uh, you know, again, a fraction, maybe it's uh, a third or so of what has, had been announced at one point. So, you know, it's, it's kind of up to you to decide whether or not, you know, that's disappointing, still a significant amount of project activity. But um, if I only delivered on a third of what I promised uh, to deliver, you might be you might be a little bit disappointed. Uh, another area where we see this gap between what's been announced and actually delivered is the Western Balkans, um, and I think you know th this reflects the fact that some of some of these countries have access um, to funding from the European Union, um, and will often take that over having um, funding from the Chinese. Um, but again, the theme here is, you know, only you, you see only a handful of uh, green completed projects here and really an ocean um, of projects that have been announced but not completed. I suspect within that ocean of uh, yellow that there are probably more red projects too. Um, really, it's, it's tough to cancel projects officially. And so they often die a long, slow death. Uh, you know, no public official really wants the spotlight uh, to cancel a project, um, you know, they're much more interested in announcing them. In Southeast Asia, where I think some of these activities are actually um, the sort of the competition to provide infrastructure, I think is often the most intense. Um, China is clearly not the only actor. This is a story that I think gets lost sometimes in Western coverage of this broader, um, this global infrastructure build out story and China's activities in the world. Um, you know, reading only uh, Western newspapers, you would think that China is the only country doing large projects. Um, and the reality is that, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, Japan is the incumbent um, and has been doing large projects there for decades. 
Um, and I think there's actually, um, you know, learning that has probably occurred on the Chinese side from having seen um, Japan do that. But Japan's still very active and outspending China in some important markets as well. I, I mentioned that just because it's important to remember that um, you know, the demand for infrastructure far exceeds the ability of any one country to provide it. Um, and you know, as the United States tries to think about how do we um, how do we you know remain engaged in some of these areas, um, I think working with partners and allies is an important part of that. Particularly, um, you know, countries who are already already very active. So before we sort of look ahead, um, and I'll mention a few uh, a few trends that I think are important to watch going forward as this Belt and Road continues to change. Uh, one of the most important developments I think in the last um, uh, three years has been a real decline in project activity, um, and there are some I think several factors that have constrained project activity. Um, but we see a pretty steep decline. So the peak Belt and Road years were probably 2016, 2017, just based on the data we have. This is difficult to know for, for certain because uh, a lot of the lending and activity is done um, not transparently. Uh, but several economic indicators suggest the project activity has declined significantly. And this is before the pandemic, uh, which really froze a lot of activity. Um, and Chinese officials uh, last July said that about 20% of Belt and Road projects have been seriously affected by the pandemic, and about 30% were somewhat effective, affected by the pandemic. Um, and still, however, they were um, very insistent on noting that they were unaware of any major projects being canceled, um, which we know is not true, um, but I think goes to underscore the fact that canceling these projects is, is politically difficult. Uh, anywhere, but especially on the Chinese side, when this is Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy vision, uh, it just makes you know cutting losses all that more difficult. Um, a few other factors that I think are contributing to the decline in activity are China's uh, decline in foreign exchange reserves, so just less you know less financial uh, firepower to to use on these projects, um, as well as a management challenge that I think was created. Um, that stems from how this was rolled out and conceived in the first place. You know, as I mentioned, there is no project criteria for what officially qualifies as a Belt and Road project. There still, to my knowledge, is no is not a sufficient uh, bureaucratic apparatus to manage this set of activities outside of China. Um, and so there have been, I think, challenges actually providing adequate oversight over Chinese state-owned enterprises who often have more agency than the Chinese officials who are supposed to be nominally supervising them. On the ground, um, and then there's been the experience uh, of uh, participating countries, who I think have, who now look at these offers for projects with a bit more um, skepticism, uh, and some, you know, and, and a bit more concern, having seen, you know, either through what's happened through their own experience or having seen what's hap what's happened with others, um, and so that's another that's another constraint here. Um, this is not surprising, though. I think we. You know, we know um, there are studies done on, on large projects um, suggest that large projects cost tend to cost more than expected, take longer than expected, and deliver fewer benefits than expected, even in the best business environments. And China, remember, is going into some very difficult business environments um, through the Belt and Road. So I think we, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise that there's a that there have been obstacles, um, and I think there's some learning happening here too on the Chinese side an increased awareness of some of these risks. Um, and so what I think we are looking at going forward is a smaller project pipeline, um, you know, less activity, maybe that, that gives um, the Chinese side an ability to, to pay more attention to quality control of the projects it chooses. But there's also, I think, some resiliency to this set of activities, even in the countries in which there have been scandals around Belt and Road projects. Um, so this is a, a photo of the second Belt and Road Forum in 2019. And I think what's uh, really telling about this is you have leaders standing in this photo, uh, attending the Belt and Road Forum, who campaigned against the Belt and Road. Um, and so Mohammed Mahathir um, in Malaysia, uh, you know, one of the biggest critics of the Belt and Road, um, uh, Imran Khan uh, also made some um, critical remarks. Um, but then, you know, when these leaders take office, their options for attracting investment are limited. 
Um, and so they do what many um, savvy politicians do and they change their position and uh, you know, did some renegotiating of, of existing deals. Uh, but then they not only attended the forum, but they took the stage and publicly endorsed this. So I think that just, just again, underscores the, the continued need for investment globally. Um, so China will, will have opportunities to do these projects um, even, even after making mistakes. One very important trend to watch going forward is a increased emphasis on digital infrastructure. Um, this is something that's been a part of the Belt and Road since the beginning. Many projects that you might not think of as being digital have a digital component. So we're looking here at a picture of Xi Jinping at the port of Piraeus in Greece. Uh, and so you might think of that port and you might think mainly of the containers that you see in the photo. Um, but there is digital infrastructure at the port. And after the port, uh, after part of the port was taken over by a Chinese state owned enterprise, Costco Shipping, uh, they put up a tender to redo the network infrastructure at the port. Lo and behold, Huawei won the tender. And so they built much of the um, infrastructure that you see in the diagram on the right. This has been combined also uh, often it's you know, typical to lay fiber optic cables near roads when they're built or rail projects when they're built. Um, and so it's been there all along, but I think it's going to be an even more important dimension of the Belt and Road um, because, you know, countries now have less fiscal space to borrow and to do uh, large, large projects. Um, transport and energy projects, which have been, those have been the most active areas for Belt and Road. Um, they tend to cost more than uh, digital infrastructure. Digital infrastructure is not cheap, um, but it tends to cost less than large transport and energy projects. So it might be more feasible for re recipient countries. The, the pandemic has also underscored um, you know, the real, the costs of being on the losing side of the digital divide, you know, the fact that we're able to have, um, you know, this conversation this evening relies heavily on digital infrastructure. And so I think it's underscored for countries, the importance of having these systems. Um, and one, one other factor I'll mention too, is that as Chinese companies, Chinese tech companies have come under for more scrutiny uh, in advanced economies in order to continue to grow they are doubling down in developing and emerging markets. Um, and so the Belt and Road for them is a very convenient, remains a very convenient avenue. This is one set of activities. I can say more about this if people are interested in it, but um, subsea cables is an area where um, China went from a little over a decade ago, having almost no capability in this area to now having the world's fourth company now owned by Hengtong Group uh, to, to make these systems. These are the systems that carry 95% of data internationally. And people often think it's you know, satellites that are carrying data, but it's, it is really these subsea cable systems. Um, and so this is an area in which China is much more active, uh, in which there is continued demand um, as more, more countries uh, uh, grow and more populations come online. Uh, safe cities, or as they're often called by uh, the Chinese companies that are selling these products, uh, they're often called safe cities by the Chinese companies selling these products, but as part of a broader smart city um, set of developments, I think is another uh, important set of activities to watch going forward. This is a, an analysis we did of agreements that countries had signed with Huawei for safe city equipment, which includes often surveillance cameras. Um, and I think what, what comes out of this, um, this survey here is that, you know, you've got really heavy focus on Asia and Africa. You've got a lot of partly free countries. You've got a lot of middle income countries. You know, th these are the markets of the future. Uh, this is where a lot of the world's population growth is going to occur. Um, and so if, if they're, you know, using um, you know, the choices that they make on what infrastructure they're going to use in their cities, you know, their urbanization is also a big, you know, huge trend over the next few decades. Um, so I think this is, this is, again, something that has commercial implications. It has strategic implications. Um, happy, to, happy to talk more about that if people are interested. Finally, um, it, you know, as we think about what should the United States do about this, I think there's been a little bit of positive movement over the last year, year and a half. Um, you know, the, the United States sort of went through uh, I think three phases in reacting to the Belt and Road. The first phase was to sort of um, not say anything. Uh, and, and I think that in the earliest days, the United States had its own 
uh, affirmative set of economic policies, especially the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that it was promoting. And so it didn't need to really talk that much about Belt and Road. I think people were trying to figure out too what Belt and Road really was. Um, the second phase I think was criticism. Um, that was most of the last four years. And, um, but I think there had been a shift about a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, to trying to compete in certain areas. Um, and on the sort of positive development side, I would put things like, you know, the United States now has a functioning export import bank. There's a new um, US development finance corporation, which has a larger portfolio cap um, and is able to take equity stakes. You know, these tools are important. They're not nearly, they don't have nearly as many resources as China's equivalent of these tools have. Um, but it's a, an important development. Also, there have been some efforts to work with partners and allies, uh, especially Australia and Japan, in trying to provide alternatives uh, to China's projects. Uh, so I'm happy, happy to talk more about that um, uh, if people are interested. Uh, and in, in closing here, here are a few other trends that I think are watching, uh, worth watching. One of them is what you might call the great renegotiation. Um, I think over the last year, Chinese officials have spent more time renegotiating deals than they've spent negotiating new deals. That's because of a lot of the financial stress that the pandemic has placed, particularly on developing economies. You know, you've got over 100 uh, countries going to the IMF for debt relief. For most of them, China is their largest bilateral official creditor. And so there's a lot of renegotiating happening um, and these countries are not negotiating with a single China. They're negotiating with uh, policy banks in China. They're negotiating with Chinese state-owned enterprises. Um, and so it's a little bit chaotic uh, and, also, and, and often not transparent. Um, the Health Silk Road is something that ha has been emphasized since the pandemic. Um, happy to talk more about that. There hasn't been since the beginning of Belt and Road a real coherent uh, health dimension. Um, health policy coordination was, is mentioned in some early Belt and Road planning documents um, to include things like sharing information uh, to increase pandemic preparedness. But I think we know that that wasn't done. Um, and now, so I think I'm a little bit cynical about this, but in the aftermath of a pandemic, the Health Silk Road has, has become a major theme. Um, uh, and, you know, China has a vaccine to offer now too, which makes this a bit more real. Um, but this has not been part of the Belt and Road um, since, since the beginning. Uh, and I mentioned some of the US and allied alternatives. So uh, why don't I leave it there? I'm really interested to, to hear any reactions people have um, and happy to answer as many questions as I can. Thank you. Okay, great, uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to start with the question of uh, what you ended, uh, where you ended, uh, that is uh, uh, impact of COVID. So um, could you talk a little bit more about uh, how um, existing uh, projects um, are changing uh, as an impact, as a uh, result of COVID, uh, if at all? And, uh, and then also you, know, you mentioned a little bit about uh, um, health BRI or something like that, you know, now uh, uh, Chinese government is talking about. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about, you know, how this may be changed um, after COVID? Sure. So I, I think one of the really, you know, one of the really interesting things about um, the, the pandemic is that it's, it's really underscored the fact that not all connectivity is good. Um, and, and I think, you know, the Belt and Road, as it's advertised, would have you believe that just all forms of connectivity are good. Um, but, you know, we know, you know, historically, um, even, you know, on the ancient Silk Road, um, you know, the, the, the plague spread, right? And so there are risks that come with connectivity whether it's you know, the transmission um, uh, you know, of, of viruses or uh, financial risks too. Um, and so I think, you know, I think a lot of countries are sort of uh, reevaluating the degree to which they want these connections with China, um, you know, but that, that underlying demand for infrastructure is still there. And so I think that will we'll continue to provide opportunities. The immediate impact on this set of activities was that it paralyzed many of them. Um, if you think about the timeline for the pandemic, um, you know, at least the sort of by the point at which many countries were aware of it and responding to it, um, it was, you know, 
early in the year, um, many Chinese workers had had gone home, um, you know, for for holiday, and um, some of them, you know, were then not able to go back and work on projects for some time, um, and so that really that really paralyzed some of these activities. Um, and it really is, you know, it's more than an inconvenience for large projects because, you know, a lot of this is done on a timeline with lending that assumes that the project's going to be complete by a certain point. Um, and so that all adds to the financial strain of some of these um, developing economies to have projects, um, you know, be frozen, um, you know, it just it increases the, the financial strain on them. Um, one other, I think, interesting um, uh, set of developments that happened relatively early on in the pandemic was uh, and I think sort of hints at some of the influence that China has been able to build with the set of activities is you had almost a Belt and Road echo chamber, um, you know, in the early days of the pandemic where Beijing was able to get statements of support for its response to the pandemic from a whole host of countries and different parts of the world that made it sound as if, uh, you know, the world was approving of China's response. Um, you know, so countries like not only Pakistan, but also Serbia and also Ethiopia. And then all of a sudden it starts to sound like there is this sort of broader base of global support. Um, the Health Silk Road is something that's been emphasized more and more since the pandemic. Um, and initially, I think it was, you know, often tied to providing, um, you know, equipment, PPE gear, um, uh, you know, and, and medical supplies, in some cases, medical assistance as well. There are some instances of, of Chinese medical personnel um, being, being uh, deployed in response to the pandemic. You know, I, th I think for countries that were really struggling, that was um, an effective short-term um, uh, incentive. Um, but now China also has, I think, a much more um, potentially um, impactful, influential, um, you know, offering, which is, uh, you know, a vaccine, uh, not as transparent in terms of, you know, the data that's been collected about it, um, uh, as, uh, some of the Western alternatives, but being able to offer that to the developing world is, is a pretty powerful, um, carrot. And so then I, I think that makes the health silk road a bit more real. Um, uh, but it, I, I guess you know my my sort of initial skepticism there um, is that it's not as if China has been building hospitals in all of the countries participating in the Belt and Road. Um, you know, there's sort of scattered uh, health-related projects here and there, but really no coherent theme. And some of them are pretty self-interested. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but you know, like building a hospital in Pakistan. Um, where uh, 70 or 80 percent of the patients are Chinese because they're basically Chinese workers, you know, in that area. Um, so, you know, I, th I think still a concept that I think is intended to compensate a little bit for um, China's mishandling of the pandemic in the first place. Um, but it's, it's something that I think is going to be with us as long as the pandemic is with us. Great. Um, so, uh... One of my students who is taking international political economy class, uh, who is also who is writing a paper, research paper about Belt and Road Initiative, um, uh, raised the fundamental question: <laughs> that is, uh, is this for global development or global dominance? And um, Steve Cotton actually uh, really uh, eloquently um, summarized. Uh, the case that this may be a uh, um, global dominance. And so he said that this is obviously a grand strategy to make countries around the world dependent upon Chinese largest and cash in order to build alternative alliances to those with the United States. Um, so uh, which one is it? And then also uh, I'd like to add one more uh, factor, possible factor. So. Uh, uh, there is another uh, great book about BRI uh, written by Ming Ye, uh, and then we hosted her uh, talk uh, last November, and then some of you have been there or there, so uh, you may remember it. So she, her argument is this is actually basically a product of domestic politics. Uh, and then so, uh, so all the implications, international implications are kind of unintended consequences uh, of the domestic product of uh, BRI. So uh, how much is it coming from the kind of domestic political uh, situation? And then uh, how much is it for um, 
international purpose and then international purpose can be right on both sides like one may be like a more like a benevolent like global development but the other is like uh, uh, many people suspect that this is for china's global dominance so how would you um, sort out those like uh, po uh, possible uh, purposes of uh, bri thanks so you know when i started looking at projects five years ago i was very tempted you know working at a national security think tank, I was very tempted to sort of place them in the categories, oh, this must, this project must be, you know, mainly strategic, uh, especially projects for which the economic rationale looked a little bit shaky, right? So you see a, a port that's being built that um, might not actually uh, see a lot of tra commercial traffic and you start to ask, well, is it actually going to become a Chinese naval facility? Um, those types of questions. Um, and what I've learned from looking at a lot of projects since then is that, you know, it's a lot more complicated. Um, you know, there are projects that are both economically and strategically important. Um, you know, there are projects that are uh, also neither economically nor strategically important. And that those might be motivated more by some of those domestic factors that, that you're alluding to in men's work. Um, because there are interest groups who benefit just from building things regardless of their commercial or strategic merits. Um, and those interest groups are not thinking on sort of decade long timelines or you know, multiple decades. Um, uh, and they're, they're really just looking to build things and move on. Um, and they're not gonna be really held accountable for whether a project is commercially successful or strategically important. So I, I, do, I do find myself agreeing with men that the, the, the domestic drivers are extremely important, um, you know, especially China state-owned enterprises, I think, are, are on the ground the most influential actors. They have um, really the, the, they enjoy the spoils of this activity most immediately. Um, they also, they have more technical expertise, more personnel, um, often more, you know, walking around money um, than the, the officials that are supposed to be supervising them. And so I think that they're really um, important actors I would also say, though, that you know, as we're as we're sort of underscoring the importance of domestic politics, the domestic politics of recipient countries are extremely important, um, and you know, lead to, um, in good cases, lead to better oversight um, and actual you know reasonable projects being done, and in bad cases, lead to white elephant projects, you know, named after the leaders of uh, of that country, um, and there are plenty plenty of examples of that. So I think you know. On the domestic politics side, we got to look at both ends of that. Um, and there's a whole there. There really is a um, a uh, you know spectrum of impacts. Um, and so you know, I, I'm sorry. I just I find myself unable to kind of put it into one category. Um, you have to look at individual projects, and you have to look at the local circumstances uh, that are motivating those projects. Thank you. Um, so uh, you actually uh, start uh, already answering the question. So uh, uh, to the uh, what uh, Steve asked, uh, that is like uh, uh, the kind of bribery at, at both ends. And then I found that in your book, uh, there is a lot of examples that uh, you know China is often like criticized as like a lot of corruption uh, in Chinese domestic politics. But at the same time, like. Uh, they are they encountered a lot of the corruption uh, of the local officials of um, um, the recipient countries and then they are a kind of strategic interactions of corruption <laughs> of uh, uh, you know the, to from the both ends um so one question that david come asked us uh so what is the ratio of the government versus private enterprises or i think that this is a state-owned enterprise versus uh private enterprises in BR, BRI projects. Uh, do you have any um, data about it? The rough number of about, uh, about it? Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I see very few examples of, of, you know, truly private companies, you know, being the, the prime mm -hmm. contractors on these projects, just because, um, you know, the, the largest, um, you know, China's best, most capable um, companies, especially in the infrastructure space, um, happen to be, um, you know, state-owned enterprises. Um, you know, we, we could we could talk about Huawei as a you know a company that is um, you know not technically a state-owned enterprise, but has received mm -hmm. lots of state support, has connections with the state. Um, I think in the digital infrastructure space, that's obviously an example. Depends on sort of how broad you want to draw the 
um, uh, the uh, um, the tent for for Belt and Road activity. But in the in the things that we often think of, you know, the port projects, the rail projects, road projects, energy projects, really overwhelmingly state-owned enterprises. Yeah. So yeah, actually, it's true that you know, when for Chinese politics, it's not so clear whether uh, which one is a state-owned enterprise and then which one is a private enterprise, and. Uh, some companies are nominally private, but actually very much like influenced by the government. Um, my one question uh, is, you know, you compare um, the uh, Chinese projects uh, with the projects uh, uh, by Japan. So, uh, so is it true that you know, Steve asked me this, asked us this question? Though in the case of Japanese projects, it's basically about making money. So. Uh, is it true that the Japanese projects are mostly more profitable while, um, and then uh, the, from the project uh, they can repay uh, while Chinese projects are much less profitable? So I, mean, I think there's, you know, I've, I have a book on, uh, I have a chapter mm -hmm. on Southeast Asia in the book that talks a lot about Japan and Japan's experience, especially in the 1980s. Um, when Japan was really criticized by the US for um, doing projects and lending at rates that are too high and favoring its own companies. And I mean, there were tensions over trade, um, you know, on the Hill, uh, congressmen were accusing Japan of predatory economics. So I think there are lots of, lots of, you know, uh, similarities uh, in, in terms of some of the, the basic concerns, but Japan came out of that criticism and really improved its practices in, in, in some important respects, you know, um, much more transparent uh, in terms of the, the deals that it does, um, you know, really a, a, a standard setter when it comes to um, uh, infrastructure standards. And I think, you know, Japan did something very, very uh, smart tactically in responding to the Belt and Road, didn't say, you know, all Belt and Road projects are bad. It said instead, here are uh, ways of thinking about what makes infrastructure projects good. You know, here are the criteria you should look at to think about what quality means for infrastructure. Um, and I think that's, you know, a, a savvy way of putting forward, you know, raising the bar on this competition. Um, you know, I, I, there's an interesting example, I won't get too into the weeds on it, but I, I, I've seen competing projects um, where um, both, there's both a Japanese and a Chinese offer, um, you know, and I've, I've seen it go both ways, but in some cases I've seen um, both projects actually happen. Um, and I do tend to think um, that uh, the Japanese model tends to do a little bit more risk mitigation up front, tends to pay a little bit more attention to, uh, you know, some of the environmental and social impact risks and some of the financial risks. So um, just one really, one, one difference that might strike you as being very simple, but is actually very important, um, is this emphasis on when the cost estimate is done for a project, um, oftentimes operations and maintenance costs are left out um, when, when China is making an offer. So it makes the project seem mm -hmm. less expensive upfront than it actually is. Um, and so, so recipients get into a, a problem where um, it ends up costing them much more to run and operate this asset than they thought they would. Japan's been a real, um, uh, uh, leader in terms of advocating for life cycle cost assessments, which take into account those operations and maintenance fees. So really, you know, very technical, you know, in the weeds distinction, but I think that's, that's one, one way in which you do see um, these, these uh, different approaches playing out. Yeah, that's actually really uh, uh, corresponding to uh, my experience of interviewing Japanese business people who say that uh, they emphasize that uh, uh, their strength is really um, um, you know, the maintenance and other services after the project uh, was finished and project was built. Um, that so uh, some people ask the question of how about this case, you know, the some like various cases like in Bangladesh and then others. Um, I was very, I really enjoyed your uh, case studies uh, in, in your book. So you would go like uh, Central Asia, Russia, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and East Africa, they are the cases that are discussed in your book. Which case were you surprised most? And could you explain the case a little bit? 
Uh, it's a it's a good question, and um, I mean, I think I had I had in a way I had surprises sort of wherever I went. Um, uh, you know, I th I think um, I went into East Africa probably knowing the least about that region, mm. um, and so you know had had the mo had the most to learn, um, and that's really the chapter where I start to talk about digital infrastructure, um, and you know, so I, I think. One of the one of the surprises to me, um, one of the small surprises, was uh, going to Djibouti, um, which you know is, it hosts several military bases um, and has important port infrastructure and important naval location. Um, it's you know <clears throat> really um, known for you know those those attributes, uh, but it also happens to be a really important uh, landing point for subsea cables. Is something that's not not talked about quite as much, um, but I thought that you know in in that region um, the importance of digital infrastructure became clearer to me. Um, also, I think it highlighted uh, uh, the success that um, China has had, or its ability to be flexible in working with different types of governments and different business environments. So um, Ethiopia, which I talk about in the book. Their telecom sector has been state-owned uh, for years. I mean, it's it's opened up a little bit in the past two years. Um, it, whereas Kenya, which I also talk about, has been more open, more competitive, um, and, and Chinese companies have been really successful in both of them. Uh, really dramatically different environments, um, but you know, I think that really speaks to um, you know a strategy that that's actually working for them in those places. Um, so I, I think it, I think it's something that the U.S. needs to think more about, um, and so it's something that I started to think a lot more about after going there. So related to that, uh, you talk about East Africa, especially Djibouti, and then that's actually the very like uh, really like a uh, focus point of uh, security uh, of the region. Uh, Wayne Trimmer, our uh, Tower Star, uh, Tower, uh, Tower Center Forum member, uh, asked. The, Specific, quite specific question. So uh, do any of the port infrastructure deals include authority or authorization for China's military ship visits? So this is in the category of things people worry about, but unless you're you know, in a, in a three letter agency, you probably aren't <laughs> gonna see the, the actual agreement. You know, unfortunately just th this, this is, you know, another indication of lack of transparency around these deals. In some cases, um, like in Pakistan with Gwadar, um, there was at one point a Pakistani official who, who mentioned the prospect of China using it as a naval facility in the future. So, you know, they were on the record saying that in the Financial Times. Um, so, you, you know, but there, there aren't, you know, many statements like that um, to associate um, with, with other, you um, with other projects. And so then it becomes, you know, really incumbent on the analyst to try to figure out, um, you know, how valuable would this asset actually be? Does it actually have the right infrastructure to support those types of things? Um, the uh, US Naval War College has done a really good set of case studies really deep uh, on a set of ports that, that looks at some of those questions. Okay, uh, so I'd like to uh, give you uh... Last question, and this is a little bit big question. So that is, uh, I would say, uh, so what should the US do? <laughs> right. So uh, uh, that covers uh, some of the questions at least. Uh, Eugenia said that uh, US does most of its long oriented support through a multi, um, multi uh, um, um, multilateral uh, development banks. And then that support is not really recognized by countries as US in origin. And uh, so do you think to counter BRI image-wise, PR-wise, that the US should take some of those contributions to multilateral programs and have a substantial bilateral infrastructure loan program? Uh, so, uh, so that's actually a, a quite specific question. And then uh, Brie asked um, very, uh, well, more um, broadly, uh, so uh, how would you recommend more transparency with the BRI projects around the world? So uh, it's notoriously, um, it's notorious that in BRI, many BRI projects have a transparency problem, uh, but at the same time, so what, what can we do to make, make them more transparent? 
Thanks. So on, on the first question, um, yeah, it is true that the U.S. works um, through the multilateral development banks. Um, we, you know, we have smaller amounts of, of um, financial uh, capacity in the new U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Um, you know, it's an important tool, but it's nowhere near the size of, um, you know, China's equivalent, nor is the U.S. Export-Import Bank anywhere near the size of China's equivalent. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, in terms of reputation, I think, look, it's going to depend on the, on the country we're talking about. But I think overall, um, you know, the Belt and Road has been, in some cases, its own worst enemy. Um, you know, it's doing you know, the, the Belt and Road brand, um, again, depending on where you go, is not... Um, is not great um, because of a lot of the mistakes that have been made. Um, and I don't see it being, you know, really enhanced by the pandemic. Um, and, you know, I think we see, we see um, some evidence of that in, in terms of uh, companies being unwilling to associate themselves with Belt and Road um, and countries being less eager to participate in Belt and Road related events. There was one a few weeks ago um, in Central and Eastern Europe um, in which you know, several countries sent uh, lower levels of representatives um, than they otherwise would have. Um, and so I think, I think the US doesn't necessarily um, need to you know, counter the Belt and Road's reputation. Um, you know, I, I do think we need to compete in some areas. The first thing, so I've got sort of three thoughts on what the US should do here. I think the first one is that we need to begin from a point of thinking about what are our own interests? Um, you know, our interests are not the same as China's interests. Our strengths are not the same as China's. And so rather than getting into the situation where we're just reacting uh, to what China is doing with certain projects uh, or even certain types of infrastructure, let's just step back and consider really what our interests are um, and what our capabilities are. Um, the, second, the second sort of broad suggestion I have is we need to get better at separating the, the activities that China is doing that are truly threatening to US interests versus those that are um, you know, benign or you know, somewhere in the middle. Um, and there's an art to that when it comes to looking at infrastructure projects, it takes time and technical knowledge to try to sort some of that out. Um, but you know, the US has a, has a uh, government that should be able to do that. Um, and doing that would help us prioritize among those things that we actually do need to react to and, and, and put resources in to compete with. Uh, and then finally, you know, I think the door is open to work more closely with partners and allies, in, uh, including some who are very active, you know, like Japan is in Southeast Asia, Australia is very active in other places, uh, you know, Pacific Islands. Um, I think you know, the, the new administration has an opportunity to work more closely with Europe and European partners. Um, and so we don't have to do it all alone. We don't have to have all of the funding ourselves. Um, you know, there's, there are sort of collective uh, action challenges there and lots of coordination issues to work out, but I think there's a real opportunity. Uh, I mean, on transparency, uh, you know, I just don't, I don't think, you know, the Belt and Road doesn't do well under uh, scrutiny, uh, public scrutiny. You know, it's designed to be a sea of bilateral deals, um, you know, done behind closed doors. Uh, and so it doesn't hold up very well um, often when, you know, sunlight comes in. Um, and so in order to enhance transparency, I think, you know, some of that begins with recipient countries insisting on greater transparency. Um, you know, I, I think that I would like at the very least for, you know, some of them to require that some agreements um, are made public, you know, and then they can, they can um, uh, you know, censor uh, sensitive information for for companies in the same way that, you know, uh, if you were to do a Freedom of Information Act request, you know, some of it would be, would be redacted. Um, but you should be able to know if you're a citizen in another country, whether, um, you know, one of your national assets is on the line if you don't pay back a loan, or whether, you know, a dispute is going to have to be settled in a Chinese court. Um, if, you know, I, think, I think that's information that, um, that should be shared. I also think countries would benefit from sharing information with each other, uh, even if it's not done, you know, releasing all of our agreements uh, out into the public. Um, there's, there have been some examples, you know, country A finds out that country B got a better interest rate on a loan. That becomes their new bargaining position. Um, and, and so I, I think that uh, 
more, greater transparency would uh, strengthen the negotiating hand of some of these uh, some of these uh, countries who are participating. Finally, I do think it's worth supporting you know civil society efforts and journalism um, in in um, countries that um, these activities are happening in, which is frankly most of the world. But I think you know a strong uh, independent press is often um, effective in pushing back uh, and helping to you know hold accountable um, some of the deals that shouldn't have been done in the first place or were done. Um, you know, not in the right way. So I think I think supporting that set of, of activities is important as well. Great, thank you very much. Well, uh, BRI is a huge uh, project, a national project. Um, and then, uh, so uh, when I was uh, um, uh, in China, um, uh, my uh, office mate uh, had a habit of speaking, habit of saying uh, that uh, China is big. And uh, that actually, China saying China is big, uh, explain many of the things. Um, China's presence, China's influence all over the world is huge, uh, simply because China is big. Uh, so uh, if uh, any country, even uh, the United States, uh, tries to compete with China in the same way, uh, on the same ring, then it's difficult uh, to, um, uh, it, it would be difficult to uh, win the competition uh, in terms of the quantity. So, uh, so in that sense, I, I agree with you about, uh, especially I agree with you about uh, um, what US should do. And the US should seek right, uh, its own uh, interests and then own, set the own goal. And then I think that's actually very uh, important. Um, so uh, this is actually, again, uh, this is a national project. And uh, so uh, you said in the book that uh, uh, this will continue uh, beyond Xi Jinping's um, administration. Uh, and then we don't know how long uh, it will um, last uh, because uh, uh, President Xi uh, recently um, uh, lifted uh, his term limit. Uh, so, uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, but, uh, President Xi also is human, so uh, so his administration uh, will end sometime, and then uh, his successor will take over um, uh, China's uh, uh, one-party rule. Um, but uh, BRI may uh, continue uh, beyond Xi Jinping. So uh, this is a very like a long-term project, and and yet uh, also also the United States has to uh, work with China, uh, work uh, with the BRI, uh, manage the BRI um, for a uh, long term. So uh, I hope like uh, you all have uh, uh, some, um, you learn um, something uh, about BRI. And uh, so uh, with better understanding, uh, you have uh, a better understanding of uh, China's influence in the world as well as the world politics uh, more in general. So please join me for uh, thanking uh, John Hillman. Thank you everyone. And thank you Hiroki for moderating. This was a great program and thank you John for being um, with us this evening. So we just want to um, make sure y'all all go and look at our website, look for upcoming programs, do sign up. Um, we have three programs next week. So um, we hope to see y'all then and have a great evening. Thank you everyone. Thank you, bye.